Hey everybody, I, uh, I'm about ready to start laying out my sphere so I can build uh, control lines to do my layout. So, what I just did is I established center at the very top, so that when I put my other vertical marks on the face of the sphere, uh, not only do I have a reference below, but I have a reference above, so that I'm not angling my pin tool one way or the other, so that it's consistent to the center point above. Now, there is a, an element of... Uh, of, I mean, the human aspects of this that, that essentially allows things to vary to a certain extent. But I also mark each one that represents the center. They're all 90 degrees apart from each other. So when I'm running my pin tool, I'm looking at my point up here, and I'm following. I'm following the edge of the of the square. Now at the bottom, I'm just trying to follow a consistency with what I do at the top. One thing that uh, you may not be aware of is that. All my work tables 
what I work off of are all built on angle iron and a grid of angle iron to keep the table super flat. And then that table is rested on another table um, via all thread. So I have an all thread a riser here, all thread riser, all thread riser, all thread riser, all thread riser, that you can't see this below. So no matter where I put my table, I can level the table. I think a lot of people don't quite understand how important it is to work off a level surface. I'm working off a level surface. Um, then when I'm looking at the piece, I'm looking at it in real life. The, the table's not level and you're building a piece and you stand back and look at it. You know, um, using a reference, a lot of people don't realize this. If you're working off a level table and typically a door jam, it's plumb. I can eyeball, I'm working on a piece, I can eyeball a piece against the door jam behind to determine how vertical it is. But if the table's not level, you have a problem. You know, and the other aspect of level is, is when you fire, I even level up my kiln. Not only my kiln is level, but when I get ready to put a piece of any size, one of, for instance, one of my larger shears, these ones not so much, I will typically make sure that the base point that I'm putting it in is level. I put every uh, detail out that I can imagine that will help me to have a good product. Um, and I believe that if you're, if, when you're firing something, if, the, if the, the base isn't level, you have the risk of gravity playing into it as, as the heat is hitting your piece. You know, so maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think so. So, but part of why level is so important to me is, I mean, I've been a bricklayer for, what, 34 years of my life, worked in construction in some aspect, really become, come to understand how important the concept of level and plumb is. I would take that even further. There are people that, that are throwing pottery um, you know, possibly on a surface that has, I don't know, three-eighths of drop, three -eighths drop per foot. So if the base of your, of your throwing wheel is two feet, you're going to be out of level by three quarters of an inch. So when you're throwing, you're throwing a vertical off an unlevel base. So after that piece is finished, you go and set it on a table in a house where the concrete's level, the piece is going to be out of plumb. It's subtle, but I, I think the eye is, has the ability to catch things like this. Uh, I mean, I always strive to to build pieces that interact with sacred geometry or the golden mean, because I believe our our intuitive nature recognizes patterns that are balanced. Now, if you're throwing in a, in a shop where it's level, no big deal, but almost every, so if you're throwing in a, on a garage floor or a patio floor, I, almost, I can guarantee you that those floors are gonna have a drop. They're not level floors. So, uh, to resolve that, you just make sure your throwing wheel is level. You know, but again, I think most people don't really, for the most part, care. Maybe don't understand. But I've come to realize, you know, I, I like the movie uh, Patriot, I believe. 
is the name of it, where he's telling his son how to, where he's teaching his sons how to shoot, aim small, miss small. Uh, when I've built structures, you know, I've been involved in structures that go 220 feet in the air. Uh, that's a whole lot of distance vertically to be off. So if you're starting off wrong at the base, as you go up, it's just going to be off more and more and more. So whenever I start a, whenever I build a structure, and I want it to be, and I want to control it, my base start point is typically as exact as, exact as you can get for the construction industry. And we, you know, we're talking sixteenth of an inch, eighth of an inch. Um, some guys don't even worry about that. But for instance, when I do an elevator shaft out of masonry, I'll have control marks etched in the concrete so that I can plumb up down every time I do a roof structure section, you know, uh, a lot of these high rises will have a roof structure section of 14 feet, 28 feet, 42 feet, um, 56 feet and such. And at every one of those points, I will run a plumb bob apparatus that I've built that's on a fishing reel that it's an extra heavy plumb bob and I'll run it down to my control point and I'll have a guy with a two-way radio telling me where our plumb bob point is off control, uh, control line or grid K. And I know that off grid K, my corner of my block work, or my brick work, needs to be at a certain point. So I can have my men adjust accordingly. So if it's out of plumb a half inch, I can have my men adjust over a period of four feet, eight feet to bring that back into plumb. I mean, it's just like a, a if you listen to a pilot that flies uh, airlines, you know, they say that the majority of the time they're, they're off course. It's a constant adjusting to bring it back. Well, it's the same with masonry. Every course is an opportunity to on or to be off and so I so you know but the only way you're going to know is by checking you know there are elevator guys will tell you that there's elevator shafts out there that are that are actually corkscrewing in the air because the guys that built them weren't checking so it's all it's all interesting but those concepts Concepts of plumb and square and all those those aspects play into to this too. I mean, building is building, whether it's small or whether it's large. You know, granted. However, a lot of people have an attitude of uh, ah, it's small, no big deal, right? I teach a bricklayer apprenticeship program and I always tell my men there's no such thing as a small job. Uh, and part of why I say that is because everything deserves the same amount of respect and attention, whether it's big or large. But I try to bring it to, into the real world with them by explaining to them when you're doing a small job for somebody you're working for a company, let's say, that small job, profit margin is very small, very little. So if you put a window in the wrong place, or you put a door six inches off and it needs to be at that one location and you have to go fix it, you've just lost your profit. So attention to detail is, is very, very important. Well, on the fact, you know, the aspect of, of your ego and and pride, you know, taking pride in your work and, and having a reputation for executing correctly is, is, is always been very, very important to me. Though having grown up in a kind of a military type aspect when it comes to my father, meaning that the failure, it's not the failure wasn't an option, but that failure is failure. And the only resolve to a failure is to admit your mistake and 
to accept it. And that's part of why I am a little bit thankful for my father because when I was in the army, when I was in the army, I went to basic and IT and I was what they, if I remember right, it's called the platoon guide, something like that sometimes. And so I was essentially like over my whole platoon and then, you know, we were enlisted and went to training. It's not like the movies where, you know, the sergeant sleeps in the barracks, he doesn't. So I was the platoon guide over about 44 guys and then we had our squad leaders and I was over them. But my saving grace was as a, as a platoon guide was as I understood that. So when the first sergeant would come in and do an inspection of our barracks and he would say, Anderson, why is so and so this locker look this way? And I could just be able to respond because I felt as a leader. I did not execute my duties appropriately. So keeping that in mind, the sergeant would go to the next platoon and you could hear him doing his inspection. He would ask that platoon leader why so-and-so was this way or why this was out of order. And the platoon guy would start making excuses. As soon as those excuses started to come out of his mouth, that platoon guide was released from it, relieved from his duty as a platoon guide, and they had a new man um, that would step into it. It's an important factor of leadership. So whenever I ran a job, which was my, what I enjoyed most, I'd been a superintendent before, and I didn't particularly enjoy being a superintendent because you're basically over foremans that are alpha males, really have very little control, plus to really become intimate with the job was difficult as a superintendent or as a foreman, I could become intimate, I could be, I could get to the point where I knew the dimensions of a room without looking at the blueprint, where I knew the job sometimes better than the architect knew the job, because I lived it every day. Um, I typically received my blueprints two months in advance so that I could start doing my own takeoffs and so that I could start, because a lot of guys who get confused, new foremans get confused when they look at blueprints, because blueprints aren't drawn in perspective. And so you have to, you have to imagine, you have to, to visualize, okay, this is a new perspective, so what would perspective look like? I used to get accused by some of my men that when I would explain things to them, one of them one day told me, he says, Dave, Dave, slow down. He says, you've already got people, in your head, you've already got people occupied in this building. You already have it landscaped and people are coming out of, in and out of the building. And uh, so if you can't tell, I obviously really, really get into what I do. So, okay, I've got all my marks made. I laid out on, a, on my yellow marks, which is 15 degrees. And 15 degrees will give me a layout of either two, three, four, six, or eight looking for a six. Part of why I'm looking for a six is because I plan on doing uh, the design that's either the seed of life or the flower of life is what it's called. So now, so, so there's a lot of math that, that gets involved in this. Yeah. So now I need to, to figure out what my circumference is. I do kind of already understand what my circumference is. Huh. Oh, here we go. Um, because these are standard size, so I know that my circumference is uh, it's approximately uh, 13 and a quarter inches. It's a 4 and 3 sixteenths di diameter sphere. So, so 13 and a quarter divided by 2 is 6 and 5 eight. 5 eighths. Divided by two again is three and five sixteenths. So I want to establish what center is now. Excuse me. What center is now? Here. So access money.
Okay, now I'm going to, to make a horizontal mark at that point. And following that point, I will mark it as the center of my sphere because I'll have multiple other, mar other marks. I take a pen tool. Well, it's not a pen tool, it's a homemade pen tool. I need it to be a little bit longer. Maybe I can set this up so it can be seen. I don't need the light, but I'm looking at it as it's filming and it's not, it doesn't look like it's lit up very good. So, so I have my mark, my center mark, I'm going to adjust this. I need all these marks to do what I want to do. I'm thinking about integrating. You know, talk about life experience and how it affects what you do. I'm thinking about doing the seat of life integrated with integrated with brick. So the brick will come up into the seat of life. these wire tools. It's got two prongs. We you know that it's three-eighths of an inch of heart. And that's what I want. So now I'm going to mark the center vertical mark and the center below. So I'm going to make these marks to highlight both the vertical and the horizontal locations. I've learned that Sometimes I don't need that, but sometimes I really need it, and it's just better. So, that was, you know, another aspect of my career as a bricklayer, my real forte. I always told people I was a better foreman than I was an actual bricklayer. You know, it's good. I've always been done with done well uh, reading blueprints and it's funny because I've had tremors for my whole life and it's kind of a, a known joke among men that work for me and that know me that uh, not to reference it if you're a new guy you know for instance one guy I was doing layout on a building and I had a new guy on my crew he says to me, what are you so nervous for? <laughs> and I, look, I looked up at the other, my guy that was with me, that had been with me for a while, and shook his head. Because <laughs> that wasn't something, I was kind of touchy about it. You know, I always refer to it, it's, it's not nervousness, it's adrenaline, it's game ready. In the thick of, of what's truly important, you know, and laying out a building is is of considerable importance. When you lay out a building.
think my corners are square, end up having brick layers, and that aren't asking you questions. So you have a corner that's out of square, and one of your men is working on that corner. If he's a good, if he's a good mason, he's going to ask the foreman, he's going to say, hey, you know, this is this corner, I'm going to have problems with this corner. And it happens. Uh, and it doesn't always, it doesn't always happen because the corner is out of square, but because the material that you're installing is imperfect. You know, and a lot of a lot of people believe that that's just how it is. You know, it's imperfect. I I've been on jobs where our material was just it, it was good material. It was square, it was dimensionally correct, with length and height. But those were kind of my four cases. It was layout. It's, it's the foundation. You know, and if you don't get the foundation aspects of things completed right, you know, it's going to be a problem. And that's not just a problem for, for the bricklayers. You know, when the, the tile guys come in to put the tile, you know, they've got to negotiate a building that's out of square. That's why sometimes when you look at tile, you know, normally your cuts are, well, of course your cuts are against the wall, but it's really weird when, when at one end of the wall you got a, you have a six inch cut, and at the other end of the wall you have a four inch cut. It's because that wall's out of square. You know, and then, like, when the roofer, not the roofers, but the iron workers and carpenters are going to put the truss in, the truss is in, and then it's out of square. You know, that can be a problem. Be a huge problem depending on what type of trusses or things of that nature. So I just I just take nothing for granted. It's all important. You know, kind of like the story of the guy that you know I don't know building a little shed or something. And the guy says, "What are you building?" He says, "I'm building a cathedral." Well, that was his attitude. And, uh, that's part of why it was important for me to be a foreman, because because there are a lot of men, a lot of foremen, a lot, not a lot, well, many, they really don't care. You know, and at the end of the day, the building gets does get built. There are men out there that don't care. And that's fine. If that's their game, and they don't care, then they can bear the responsibility that. That, that goes with that type of attitude, which it does backfire on. Right? When you're building out of masonry, you have to tear something out. It's not like you go and take a skill saw and cut a stud out of the way. I mean, this stuff is grounded solid with concrete, and you know, each block, if it's 8 8 16s, it's going to weigh a minimum of about 34 pounds. You know, I mean, you just don't fix stuff. Of work, so so I always had the attitude: build it once, build it right. You know, this whole thing: measure twice, cut once. Hell, man! Sometimes I'd measure three times, four times. You know, you just don't know. One thing that you find out is it's not unusual every time you measure you come up with a little different point. So. But it's kind of cool because when you do, you've done it so many years, things start to become intuitive. You actually start to feel things. Okay, so now I've got I, I've established some horizontal and vertical marks. So now I'm ready to start establishing uh, what I want to lay out. Granted, I do need to bring these lines up into the center. And there's a few things that I'm not going to get into that I need to do because this you may need to be adjusted ever so slightly. The distance from here to here and on land is centered there. And when I start making these marks, I have to do it in a different technique. So, so it's fun. Um, to me, this is very, very therapeutic. Um, it's not unusual for me to 
come into my shop and studio <clears throat> and lose time. Wait a second. I mean, I've been in there for five hours. Where, where did the time go? Which they refer to as being in flow or in the zone. And, um, but, uh, but I think I started saying something about this. I never really finished the thought. But it's interesting how life experience affects what you do. You know, uh, a brick and a layout of something such as that is very prevalent in my work. It's a huge part of my life. Um, let alone patterns seem to engage. Um, originally, when I started doing art, I was doing it out of stone and concrete, things of that nature. People weren't connecting to it. Don't misunderstand me. If they could get into the intricacies of it, it was, as far as I was concerned, it was extremely profound. I mean, I have a, a sculpture that I call the Tree of Life that has 3,200 individual pieces of stone layered and like 2,200 individual pieces of glass layered. Uh, it's all level. Everything is level in this piece. And it took me three months to build it. But people don't know what we didn't know what they were really looking at. They had, they had no idea, so they couldn't connect to it. Let alone the fact that a piece like that I couldn't sell for less than 50 dollars but there's nothing out there like it. I have a, a few other pieces of that nature. People didn't connect to it. When I started doing ceramics and I would do the shows, people connected to it. Part of why they connect to it is because in high school or elementary school or college they do ceramics. And so they have a sensibility about the difficulty that's involved here. Granted, I think everybody connects to, uh, to a, a sphere, so to speak. Essentially, Earth is a sphere. You know, and there's so many metaphors that can be connected to, to a sphere. One of these days, I'll have to tell you why I, I refer to it as a sphere. It's kind of a funny story, rather than walls. So, well, okay. That's it for now.